Sister Randy, you were not born for failure. You were not born for failure. You were not born to be conquered and to be undone. But I tell you this day that as you have progressively walked down into this sickness, into these infirmities, in Jesus' name, you're going to walk out too. In Jesus' name, you're going to walk out too. And you will find yourself regaining strength and vitality, bones being made smooth and formed properly again. Huh. From your neck down. Yes. The healing power of God shall be found in the bones of your body. Yes. To the point where no one, the doctor will not be able to see what he saw a week before. Why? Because you were made to conquer. Yes. You're not about failure. You're about victory in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. We're going to pray it through too before this day is done. Oh, hallelujah. Mm. Mm. Let's see here. I'm going to move this so I don't knock it down. I didn't knock a lot of things down. My, my message is staying with coffee. Sometimes you get a little excited, you know. That's the way it goes. <laughs> But we're going to talk today about the river. We want the Lord to take us to that river. Yes. And we've heard prophetically many times messages, sermons on, on the river of God. We can read about it in Scripture. We can understand that metaphorically this river is representative of God's will. God's will to fill us, to overflow in our lives. And we want this. We want this river to take us into the deep things of God. We want this river to wash away the effects of living in this sin-cursed world. We want a wondrous, life-changing, spirit-rearranging river of God to immerse us in His kingdom. Yes. Thank you for that. I hear that. I mean, we, have a, we have a vision of Ezekiel. I'm going to try this thing today. We'll see how it goes. See that? Y'all verify I'm pushing the button. You see anything happen? Let's try this button. Whoa. Okay, now I know. In, in Ezekiel 47, verses 1 through 6, we can read about a river. He's talking about, Ezekiel's talking about what the angel showed him of the temple. And the word says, Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was a water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. For the front of the temple faced east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple south of the altar. And he brought me out of the north gate and led me around on the outside of the outer gateway that faces east. And there was water running out on the right side. And when the man went out to the east with the line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits and he brought me through the waters. The water came up to my ankles. And again he measured 1,000 cubits and brought me through the waters. The water came up to my knees. And again he measured 1,000 and brought me through. And the water came up to my waist. And again he measured 1,000. And it was a river that I could not cross. For the water was too deep. <laughs> water in which one must swim. A river that could not be crossed. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? And then he brought me, returned me to the bank of the river. See, this river that he's describing here is not only representative of the will of God for our lives as his children, but it also talks of an actual river that's going to flow when Jesus returns to rule and reign over this sphere for a millennium, for a thousand years. <laughs> and to be honest, I'll tell you, it's already starting to flow. I've seen it. I've touched it. This river's already starting to flow from out underneath the temple now to do what the Lord said it would do. So we have representation, but we also have the reality. And this ankle, knee, waist, could not, he had to swim. It talks about the maturity that we can obtain in the Lord as we grow in the faith and as we grow in the grace. But we have a problem because most of us don't conceive of a river this way. Not God's river. We don't envision it 
like this at all. And I say this because we want this river of the Spirit to run straight through us from this moment into our eternity with God. But how many of us have ever seen a river like that? See, a river has twists and turns in it. It will have a place where the current is running so swiftly, and in other places it's hard to distinguish there's a current at all. On a river, you can find turns so abrupt that you think the current's going to smash you into the side of the bank, only to see it swing you out once again into the deep currents in the middle of the river. We declare that the Spirit of God is like a river. But how often do we stop to consider the movements of that river? Amen. Hmm. I'm supposed to share with some folks today, some men in particular. God, you think that you cannot be a righteous child of God because you have things in your life that you feel disqualifies you from being that child of God. And you think you can't get deliverance, you can't get rid of these things, so therefore you are disqualified for sonship under the king. But to put it bluntly, none of us go out and clean a fish before we catch it. If the enemy is telling you it can't be done, but I'm telling you this morning that you give yourself to the Lord, you become a part of His kingdom, you allow Him to enter in, and you watch what the Holy Spirit will do in your life. He will set you free because that's what the King does. He sets His children free. Don't let the enemy tell you you can't be a child of God today. Today before we leave this house. This is the day of salvation. This is the day of visitation. Get your spirit set that way right now. Talking about this river. Too often we get a word from the Lord and we expect it to happen tomorrow. Or at the most by the end of the week. We receive a call to preach and immediately we see ourselves in front of crowds of thousands. We get a revelation of household salvation and we expect our loved ones to get saved yesterday. <laughs> we get a revelation concerning the principle of tithing. And we expect financial pro prosperity to be knocking on our door by dinner time. We see it so clearly without breaks in our line of vision. And we see it wrongly because it, that is not a river. Instead, what we are looking at and what we are visualizing is a canal. It's a canal and it's not going to happen that way because a canal is man-made. This river is God's made. See, it's a man-made river and therefore it's not going to have His eternal signature upon it. It's not going to have that enduring fragrance of holiness to it. In other words, it's not going to last forever. It's man-made. When it comes to the river of God, we need to understand, first thing, it's God's river. Amen. God controls it. God declares it. God orders it out. That's the primary issue first and foremost. We don't have to be in anxiety concerning God's will for our lives. Because it's His river. No matter how easy or hard the journey, God is in control. And it will lead us to our betterment. Because God has good things for those who serve Him. Our journey on this river is just as much about God's sovereignty as it is about the destination we get to. Because in the river of God's will, the Lord will use time to get us where He wants us to be and He prepares us in the journey for what we are going to receive. See, time may be our enemy sometimes, but it's not God's enemy. Time does not control our Father. Our Father controls time to accomplish His will. And the Bible is full of these examples of flowing, dynamic will of God being played out in the lives of His people. When we allow the will of God, or if you will, the river of God, to take us where we need to go, we will learn. We will learn a lot about that river, and we'll learn a lot about ourselves in relation to that river. 
And when we take the time to examine the life of David, the king of Israel, we will find that he experienced these twists and turns in his life. He experienced those times of rapid currents where everything was just rolling and flowing, but he also experienced times that felt excruciatingly slow as progress was hard to see. But it was in the midst of these struggles that he learned. He learned what God could do for him, and he learned what he could do in God. Amen. See, the Word reveals the beginning of David's journey in 1 Samuel 6, 13, 16, 13. Samuel gets a word from the Lord. Go to the house of Jesse and bring his sons forward. He goes, Jesse brings one, two, three, seven men in all. Seven good-looking men, fine-looking men. But he, Samuel didn't hear the word. He said, do you have another? And Jesse said, well, we got one. And the youngest one, he's out taking care of the sheep right now. Samuel said, bring him. And in 16, 13, we read, when David came, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. See, the New International Version translated it this way. It says the Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power. Yes. Now, if we'd have been there, if we'd been in David's position, and I am in David's position because I am David, I never <laughs> left. If we'd have been in that position, you know what we'd done? We would have done. We'd have gone straight into the house, packed up our bag, and got ready to go. Why? Because we were going to the palace, baby. The Lord had said it. The Lord said it. We'd be done. And we just expect it to happen right now. <laughs> the Lord is anointed. The power has come. It's time to go and receive what God has for us. But the reality of David's situation was this. From the time David was anointed by Samuel, it took 15 more years before he became king. 15 years of being exalted and being brought low. 15 years of being loved and then hated. 15 years of chasing the enemy and being chased by the enemy. 15 years with songs of joy and tears of sorrow. See, David had to experience the river to get to that place of destiny God had prepared for him. What kind of king do you think David would have made without those 15 years? He could, have, he could have got out of God's will and got into his own will. He could have started taking control of things. In fact, there are a couple of times where he thought this way. When King Saul was trying to kill him and pursuing him all over the country, David went to a Philistine city to talk to Achish, the king of Gath. He was looking for a place of refuge, a place to hide. But when he got there, the king's men looked at him and said, Hey, isn't this that one they sung the song about? And you know that song where it says Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands, and we are the tens of thousands? And when David heard that, he got a little concerned because he realized he wasn't in the place he's supposed to be. And in fact, he had to pretend that he was crazy to get out of that city in one piece. But fortunately, David learned from that experience too, and he chose to trust in the Lord to lead him. He could have chosen a canal of his own design that would have looked logical and rational, but he learned to let the Lord lead him instead. Instead of what he instead of doing his best and then asking the Lord to bless what he did, he said, Let the Lord lead him. He learned obedience in this time. So within the river of God's will, He will test you. He will not tempt you, but He'll test you. Yes, he will. I've never you've heard me say it before, I'm going to say it again. What's the difference? Very simply, for the purpose, the purpose of testing is for instruction, understanding. But the purpose of temptation is for destruction, to bring you down, to bring you out of the will of God. The Lord's very clear. God does not tempt us. But He does test us. He does this not so that He can see what's in us, but so that we can see what's in us. We can see where we are in the Lord. What we need to lay down. What we need to pick up. What we need to learn. And what we need to study. And what we need to pray. 
He wants us to know the truth because you know, when it comes to us, we'll lie. All right. I mean, you know, when I look in the mirror, I see this 20 year old kid, you know, with <laughs> hair everywhere. <laughs> oh, I know I'm not the only one. <laughs> see, testing helps us understand the kingdom's precepts and principles. Testing refines us and it purges us so that we can become set in our walk with the Lord. And because of this, the mark of a man is not when he's on the mountaintop, but it's how he handles the valleys. Amen. What has he learned on the mountaintop that's going to get him a little farther down the journey that he has to overcome? The circumstances that are against him he'll have to deal with. When you study the life of King David, you will see there are three testings that occurred to him. Immediately after the episode of the anointing of David, we read of him entering into King Saul's service. First as a musician, then as a warrior. Then as a warrior to becoming the leader of warriors. From becoming a leader of warriors to becoming the son-in-law of the king. Remember, David had not forgotten that he had been anointed by Samuel to be the king of Israel. That was clear in his mind. And I can imagine him laying in his bed at night with his hands behind his head, just pondering, watching all the pieces come together. I mean, he's in the house, he's in the palace, he's the son-in-law of the king. He can just sit there and see everything working for his good. And I can imagine him laying there just praising God for the perfect logic that he saw in God's plan. But I wonder, if he'd have known the journey, if he didn't know it was going to take 15 years to get where God wanted him to be, I wonder if he'd have been able to sleep at all. See, as David worked in the administration of King Saul, he observed and he learned. He learned what was important and what was not important. He learned what to, how to get things done in the kingdom, how it operated, what it took, and he learned what he needed to lay down and avoid as well. He was able to retain what was necessary and what needed to be set aside. And you know, in the palace, David could have manipulated the system. He was a smart man. He could have developed alliances, and he probably could have led a successful revolt against King Saul. But that would have got him out of the will of God. David refused to be tempted by the trappings of power, carnal logic, and palace intrigue. So instead of finding his way in that, he turned aside. God took him out. Instead of relying on the strength of the men that thought so much of him, he chose to walk away and trust God. There's only one alliance that we read that David making while he's in the palace. And that's with Saul's son, Jonathan. And God used that alliance to save David's life in the midst of the enemy's camp. So David passed the test of worldly power and carnal power, and he chose that river, and God twisted him away from the palace. From there, David entered into the second phase of testing and preparation. See, in the first phase, he had to resist the temptation of physical power, but in the second phase, he had to pass the test of spiritual power. Was the power going to come from the spirit of man or the spirit of God? And in 1 Samuel 23, we read about David on the run, and what happens? God hands King Saul right into David's hand. The very one who was stopping him, at least that's what his men thought from entering and becoming king, was now under his sword if he desired to use it. And David's men tried to get spiritual in order to justify David striking Saul down. They even quoted a prophetic word that had been spoken to him in times past. Verse 4 we read, Then the men of David said to him, This is the day of which the Lord said unto you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as it seems good unto you. And don't think David was not tempted by this opportunity. Because wielding power can feel really good. Especially when you get to exercise it against somebody that's hurt you and abused you without justification. And you know, we have a word for that. 
But it's not a word that spiritual people really like to use because the scriptures don't condone it. But that word is revenge. Yes, we know the scriptures say the vengeance belongs to the Lord. But sometimes it feels good to borrow it from Him on certain special occasions. At least to the flesh. Here was another canal for David to contend with. And I can imagine David thinking, Hey, if I kill Saul, nobody is going to think less of me. They all know what he's put me through into this day. They'll understand because they know God is with me. Even Saul's son Jonathan has already said he'll step aside so that I can become the king of Israel. With one blow from my sword, I can fulfill the word of God and I can actually hasten it. That was the temptation. But David knew that this was not how he was supposed to fulfill his destiny. David had come to the realization that if God had anointed him, God could establish him in that anointing. Amen. And he didn't have to take the life of a man God had anointed in times past to achieve it. But there was great temptation. There was great pressure. In fact, the pressure was so strong that David actually snuck up on Saul and he cut off a piece of Saul's clothing. See, this was an outward act that was indicative of the inward struggle that David was going through. But even this temptation brought conviction to David's heart because he saw his own weakness in it. And this temptation was so great that the enemy arranged a similar situation in 1 Samuel 26. But David had conquered this temptation to the point that he not only wouldn't kill Saul, he wouldn't raise his son, hand against his son Absalom when Absalom tried to lead a revolt against David. In fact, David said, David said, we know it's for a father's love, but we also read David saying that maybe God is God's chosen to succeed me. And I don't want to get out of the will of God. I don't want to abort the plans of God. See, that's faith. That's trust. That's leaving it in the hands of the Lord. Little dangerous in the natural, perfect in the spiritual. Why? Because He's your Father. He's your Lord. He's your God. He's your King. He is able to deliver. So David passed this test of spiritual power. <laughs> but then we come to 1 Samuel 30. And we see the third and perhaps most dangerous test of all. By this time, David had found a place of respite from King Saul. David was happy. His men were content. Saul was not pursuing him. And even the Philistines were satisfied enough with David to allow him to live among them. And everything David did in that environment succeeded. Every plan was successful. Every decision was fruitful. Sure, he wasn't sitting on the throne of Israel as God had ordained, but this wasn't such a bad life after all, because at least he had control over the situation. Yes, David had passed the test of physical power, and he succeeded in the test of spiritual power, but here we find the most difficult test of all. What test is this? It is the test of absolute power. The idea that you are totally in control. That God has got you so shined up and polished that sin cannot get within a thousand miles of you. At least that's what we think. But what the Word tells us? The Word says, when you've done everything to stand, watch out. Watch, lest you fall. In 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 30, we have David and his men returning to Ziglag, where they lived. And they discovered that it had been burned to the ground and all the wives and all the children and all the property of the Hebrews had been taken. And this had all been done by the Amalekites, the very people that God commanded Saul to destroy in 1 Samuel 15. And that's a lesson for us as well. When God tells you to do something, do it. And do it with all your strength and all your might and all your heart. Because it's a dangerous place to be in when you think you can do no wrong. It's also a dangerous place when you find yourself thinking that nothing that you do really matters. It's a fearful place that can breed complacency and inattentiveness toward the things of God. 
And here the men were in such bitterness and sorrow because of what had happened that they even talked of stoning David. And David heard that and he knew they were thinking about killing him. See, it's one thing to be hated by your enemies, but when those that you have nurtured and protected and led to the heights of victory, when they turn on you, that's a heavy blow. It's a pain like no other. And I'll just add, unfortunately, there are many pastors who know exactly what that feels like. But I like what David did in verse 30, or chapter 30, verse 6. That's where we read. Now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. That word strengthen is a wonderful one because it means to fasten upon, to seize, to be strong, to strengthen, to cure, to help, to repair. So in, perhaps, in the midst of what was perhaps the most challenging crisis in David's life, he turned away from the crisis and he turned to the Word. He turned to the Lord. He turned to his Father and to his God. And the Word tells us that he even strengthened himself in that. Because you see, in this moment, David couldn't get a hold of the pastor. He couldn't find anything on the radio or TV that would give him a word of encouragement. So instead of that, he encouraged himself in the Lord. He fastened himself to the will of God with ferocity and determination and all his strength. David seized the will, seized the person of God, and he said, I stand here and nowhere else. He restrained his flesh. He refused to accept all the failings and he conquered carnality and fear in his own heart through faith in God and God's promise to him. Now how did David do this? I believe in this moment of crisis, David turned his back on what others were saying about him and even the sorrow in his own heart for his loss and he began to remember. He remembered the day Samuel came and poured the, oil, the anointing oil upon him. How the Spirit of the Lord filled his heart with presence, purpose. He remembered the times when he attended his flock and, the, and his only and closest companion was God himself as he sang to him in the darkness of the desert. Yes. He remembered the time that he walked into the valley to face Goliath with a shepherd's sling and five smooth stones and God gave him the victory. He remembered the numerous times he had found himself in the clutches of a jealous and murderous king and how God had always intervened. And as he thought back upon God's faithfulness, I believe that David started to realize that while he had not to a canal of carnality, that maybe he put himself up on the bank while the river went by. And that place was certainly not God's best for him. But right here he resolved, I'm going to get back in the river. I'm going to get back in the will. I'm going to get back in the purposes and the destiny that God has for us. And I also believe in that moment, David realized that his enemy was the devil and it was not the men holding the stones. So what did he do? Well, the first thing he did not do was he did not try to placate his army. He didn't try to talk to them, tell them everything was going to be okay. He didn't try to plot some grand combat strategy that would elevate him in their eyes. In verse 8, the word tells us that David inquired of the Lord. David went to get a word from God so that he could discern God's will in the situation. Yes. And God, in effect, told David, look, since you have sought after me, you will recover all. Woo. Oh, that's a word we need to hear, church. God wants us to recover that which is holy, righteous, and powerful in his midst. He wants us to be endued with power from on high. He wants us to be strengthened in our most holy faith by praying in the Holy Spirit. He wants us to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. He wants us to cast out devils. He wants us to baptize in Jesus' name, both in water and spirit. He wants us to raise up a people that will love Him and serve Him and walk in His will from this day forward. That's God's will for us. God told David, look, everything the enemy has stolen will be restored and returned to you and your men. Oh, don't we need that word? 
what the devil has taken, he's going to have to get back in Jesus' name. Well, I don't tell you how long. It may be a day, it may be a year, or it may be five. I don't know, but it's coming in Jesus' name. Because you are his child, and he disciplines his child. He does not forsake them. Church, all we need to understand is that God has not designed us for failure. God did not save you so that you could backslide. God did not bring you into this thing so that you would constantly be harassed by your past sins and the devil's whispering. That's not what he's about. When you said yes to God and God's will, you also said yes to the battles and victories that God has ordained for you. And our Father prepares each one of us for the fulfillment of our destinies. But we're going to have to learn the lessons of power just like David did. Because we got some, right? We talked about it a couple Wednesday nights in, in the midweek service. 2 Timothy 1.7 God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. And as we learn the lessons of the kingdom of God, we might as well prepare ourselves for a few twists and turns that are sure to come our way in life. However, even as we acknowledge that there's going to be battles, we need to remember to encourage ourselves in the Lord. We need to remember to strengthen ourselves in the Holy Spirit. Because no matter where or what you have to deal with, there's always a place for the will of God to work in the lives of His people. But it can be up to us to take hold of God, to, to, to strengthen ourselves in Him, to retain Him and listen to Him and obey Him. We need to be like Jacob in Genesis 32 and 26 when he, evaded, when he wrestled with the angel of God. What did he say to the angel? He said, I will not go until you bless me. Oh, church, if we could say that to our Father. Father, I am not going to let go until you bless me. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to go out. I don't care how much my hump, my stomach's rumbling for food. I don't care how rowdy the kids get and waiting on me. I'm going to stay in God's presence and stay in His will till He gives me direction. Yes. Till He gives me power. Till He shows me the way that, that is only His way. You know, they had a word for that a long time ago. They used to call it tearing. Amen. They would tarry before the Lord. They would lean into the Lord. And I'll be truthful. You know how many great altar times I've seen after the altar time? Yes. Amen. I mean, I've watched it time and time and again in ministry. I've watched people come forward. They pray. They seek God. They, they shake each other's hand, hug each other's neck, and then they leave. But there's a group that doesn't leave. Because they just can't. They know the world does not have their answer. Right. They know the world does not have their healing, their deliverance, their salvation. So what do they do? They press on in. And they receive what God has for them. Because beloved of God, there is a righteous way to go. There's a word for you in whatever situation you find yourself in. But it's up to us, with the help of God, to restrain and conquer our flesh and our fears. We can resist the temptation to go down that man-made canal, self-will, and we can embrace and lean hard into God's will. Yeah. Hear what I'm saying? We lean hard into God's will. When we lean hard into God's will, we're saying, God, if you don't hold me, I'm going to fall. Right. We're saying, God, I can't turn around from this position because I put all my heart, all my weight, all my being against you. You've got to hold me up, Lord. You've got to show me the way. You've got to give me strength to resist the temptation. You've got to give me power to overcome. And He will, church. Thank you, Jesse. He will. It's up to us to exercise our faith and take hold of the Lord and say, Father, I'm not letting go until you bless me. I'm not letting go until I receive that portion that you have for me and me alone. I need that touch. I need that blessing. I need that instruction. I need that presence that will enable me to go deeper into the river of your will for my life. Therefore, I'm going to encourage myself in you, knowing that you're going to reveal yourself to your own. And you will give me strength and comfort and direction. 
Sometimes we may have to say to ourselves, self, and whoever else is listening, we may have to say, I don't know what anybody else has a mind to do, but I'm stepping into the presence and the will of my Father. Is that where you find yourself today? Are you facing issues that are trying to steal your peace and joy and strength? It's time to step out on your faith in God. And if He speaks to us prophetically through a word or through the prayers of a brother or sister or even in our private prayer, we have received. And He will fill us with the peace that surpasses. And He will fill us with the joy that we don't know how to declare. The power of God will do what no man can do. And we will overcome by His strength. And I say, let God have His way, church. Let the Lord have His way. Because hear me now, we're getting ready to post. The day may come when darkness descends on this globe like a plague to the soul. But this is not that day. The day will come when the heavens truly become brass and people cannot get a word from the Lord. But it is not this day. The day may come when all help in the Lord is drained away as the saints are raptured into heaven. But this ain't that day yet. This is the day of the Lord's glory, the day of the Lord's power, the day of the Lord's strength, the day of the Lord's presence. And I'll say it to you this way. If you say to me, Brother David, I'm good. It's all cool, man. I don't need nothing. I don't need a healing touch. I don't need deliverance touch. I don't need a salvation touch. I am gooder than good, and it's all cool for me. Well, if that's what you can say, then I say, God bless you. Go with God. Or at least pray with a brother or sister who has a need. But if you can't say that, it's time to pray. If your body needs that touch, it's time to seek the Lord. If your soul needs to be fresh in the Holy Ghost, it's time to seek the Lord. If you need that baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of a new language, it's time to seek the Lord. If this is the day of your salvation, no matter how weak you feel, no matter how much the enemy wants to remind you of your failures and what you've not been able to overcome, turn away from him and turn to God. He puts no preconditions on your salvation. He's able to save you. He's able to keep you, to deliver you, free you in every measure, and set you on the right path of destiny in Him. That's His design for us. That's what we're made to do. We are made to know victory. We're made to know the power and grace of God. It's time for us to receive. Father, this is Your Word, Lord. I thank You for Your help in it, God. I thank you that when we come to the test that one day we always pass. We will pass them because you will not forsake us when we fall. You will not deny us, Lord, when we fail. Instead, you are looking to us as we humble our hearts and come to you to strengthen us, to discipline us, to restore us, and to put us in that right way of holiness. God, this is our desire today. God, this is our desire today. Holy Ghost, have your way now. 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 Now, Holy Spirit. Now, in this moment, have your way. Begin to rise up within the saints. Every man that's yours, every woman that's yours, begin to rise up, Holy Spirit, and let them conceive and see the victory that you have for them, the strength that you have for them, the presence that you offer them. Rise up, Holy Ghost, in the body of Christ so that we can be the sword of the Lord and the word of salvation. Rise up in us that we will declare the wonders and the will of God in all things. This is our day to receive, Lord, and receive we shall. And we shall tarry. I don't care. One minute, one day. We shall seek the Lord until we are found in Him. And we get that assurance that we have been heard and God has moved upon us. I know, God, that you have people here today that don't come from here, but they're here today because you willed it and you wanted it. And they shall receive in Jesus' name. 
I know that you have taken us through valleys and mountaintops to get to this hour right now. And while the rest of the church may be in fear of what's coming our way, we can stand up in the strength of God and prepare today. You call us overcomers, God, because we're supposed to come over. So come over, we shout in Jesus' name. This is our design and this is our destiny. Right now, Lord, speak to the hearts and minds of your people. Show them, God, what they can leave with you today. Show them, God, what they can receive from you today. Show them, God, how they can be changed today. For they've eaten the meat of your word and drinking of the wine of your spirit. And they have heard that you are listening and are willing to move. Holy Ghost, we give it all to you right now. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. We are your way, God. We are your way. Oh, we're your children. And I'm going to say it today because it's so strong in my heart. Brothers, there's, there's no, those among us. You're not far from God's salvation. This is the day of your salvation. This is the day when everything changes. This is the day when everything gets turned around. Because you choose to trust the Lord. In front of God and everybody. <laughs> It's so funny, you know, when you come to the Lord, the enemy tries to tell you, oh man, they're going to look and they're going to see that you're a sinner, that, that you don't have everything all right. And you'll feel so embarrassed when the exact opposite is true because Satan's a liar. When you step out in the Lord, people's hearts break for you. People's spirit wants to lead, lift you up and strengthen you in the Lord. Their desire is to see you fulfill your destiny in Christ like every other man and woman of God. And judgment doesn't even enter into the frame. That's not our business. That's God's business. We leave it with Him. But this is where we come to get redeemed. What's your need today, beloved? Men and women of God. What, you think God can't move unless the musicians come up? <laughs> no, our God needs nothing. He just asks us for our obedience and our humbling to Him. Oh, I'm not even sure that my idea I did it on this side. Visit us, Holy Ghost, with a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. Visit us with a prophetic word. Visit us with discernment and faith, O oh Lord. Visit us with the power of the Holy Spirit to do all things right and well in the Lord. And let us bear the fruit of love, the fruit of peace, gentleness, preferring one another above ourselves. Let us obey you today, God, in every way. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. This is what I would like for us to do. How many of us need a healing touch this morning? Let me see your hand. You need God to heal. God to heal. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, sisters. These are sisters. I call them sisters and sisters. All right? Sister Donna, would you come up and hold this? She's going to come and back you up. Okay? So you take hold of that. Come on, sister man. I know everybody knows, but I, I think we should know. What's it doing? The there, we don't get it. You think? It was dwell service. Oh, dwell service. It was our preaching or somebody else? It was a bald headed man, wasn't it? <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> They came to hear. They felt the power and presence of God. They moved. They left Hopkinsville to get closer to the church. That's commitment. I love it. But God has visited Donna so blessedly and so tenderly in this thing. That's why I want her to stand with the cross. And we invite you today. You need healing in your body. Come and go. 